experiments or experimental studies compared to observational studies, are there things you look for specifically or in particular for experimental studies? to increase or decrease your confidence in them? Yeah, well, first and foremost, randomization, right? So <clears throat> if an experiment isn't randomized, again, it doesn't mean that it's useless, but it just means it's gonna be a lot harder to really make sense of this. And, and randomization needs to be um, a rigorous randomization. Uh, you, you, can, you can randomize incorrectly, believe it or not. I think there's a very famous example with Predimed, which was a study that when it was published was kind of a remarkable finding a very large study, something like 7,500 people randomized into three groups, 2,500 per group, uh, given basically two different dietary patterns, a Mediterranean diet in two versions and a low fat diet. Um, this was a primary prevention study. So it was looking at people who are high risk, but who haven't had heart attacks or anything yet. And it was looking at mortality. And the study was actually stopped early. Again, something we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, because it had such a positive effect. So the Mediterranean diet had such a favorable uh, effect relative to the low fat diet that people were dying at a rate far less, uh, such that it would have been unethical to continue the study for the, I think the seven and a half years it was planned to run. And I think they stopped it in the four year mark um, and, and sort of declared victory. But then something happened, Bob, what, what happened? Actually, so they went, they went back and reanalyzed the, the, this Predimed group. Um, the first paper was published in New England Journal of Medicine 2013, and they had a basically a correction, but they they almost like a brand new article um, addressing some issues. So they did a they did a reanalysis that was published in 2018. I think it came from this this fellow named John Carlyle, who had this way this this way of looking. And I think this was we have a we've got a email on this with David Allison. So great statistician. He talks about this in his article too, um, as well, where he, he looked at this, but, um, this fellow named John Carlyle did this analysis where he looked at thousands of studies and he could flag the studies and see, does this, does this truly look like randomization based on some particular statistics? And the PREDIMED study was flagged looking like it, this doesn't look like proper randomization. There might be something going on here. And I think according to the you know, the, the media outlets, I think I read in the New York Times, they talked to the, the lead or the senior investigator and, and he said that it turns out that um, some of the villages or the, the clinics, I forget how many clinics in total there, there were in the study, but at 11 of the clinics, they, one of the uh, investigators were randomizing the entire clinics um, to one group. And that, this is what I think is really interesting about just looking at, like, if you really want to dig into a study, sometimes you really have to get the story, which is, and in, in, in why you think it, I think oftentimes you look at randomization, oh, that's really simple. You just randomize people to different groups and, you know, blinded or unblinded. It's very hard, it's very hard to blind uh, the fact that you, you, see your, you see your neighbor get a delivery every week of, of, all, of a jug of olive oil or a, or a sack of uh, mixed nuts, which were the two Mediterranean groups. And I think what happened was people started complaining in the in the in the villages. They're like, "What do I get?" And they're like, "You got your you got your low fat diet pamphlet, remember? Like we give it to you every year." Um, so that happened in that study, and that that's typically referred to as a, a. So you can do that in a study, and that's typically referred to as a as a cluster, a cluster um, randomization, where you might you might randomize one classroom to another classroom, which might be convenient, but it it requires different statistical methods. So. That was one of the things that happened there. And then right, they also, right. another let's, way. Let's use that yeah. example because that's actually a really good one, right? If you want to study the effects of meditation on, you know, attention span of kids, it's very different to say, we're going to just take a hundred kids and randomize 50 into one group, 50 into another and separate them versus saying, we've got a class, two classes over here, two classes over here we're going to split those two and two into the effect. That's a totally different um, type of randomization. One is a true randomization, one's a cluster randomization. And while you can do the latter, it requires a different statistical adjustment. So yeah, I think um, Predimed basically had to reanalyze all of their data in light of that. It, it turned out in the case of Predimed, the results still held, um, but it will always kind of be a cloud that hangs over it. Yeah, and Ian, I think Ian needs to, you know, just to make the, the his point. 
when he found it, he, I think he, he was a, a huge fan of the Predomed study. And something that he said, which I think might be intuitive, is he said if they're, if they're randomizing entire villages you know, to, to a group and they're not, they're not accounting for it, he thinks, like, I'm not sure that's going to be the only problem in that study and that every, you know, everything was uncovered. But, I, yeah. but I, on the flip side, it's really, really hard to do everything, everything, everything right in a study. They're, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah. And now imagine randomizing a household where you say, okay, yep. you know, dad, you're on a Mediterranean diet for the next seven years. Mom, you're on a low-fat diet for the next seven years. I mean, it, it starts to get very difficult. Um, okay, so again, it, that's one important thing. You also wanna make sure, is there a control group? Um, not all random design, not all um, prospective trials have control groups. Sometimes it's a single group where a person serves as their own control, and there's typically a crossover. So you'll take a group, you'll randomize them into two, but there's, um, it's not that one group is getting treatment A and the other group is getting placebo or treatment B. It's both groups get both treatments plus or minus a placebo in different orders. And uh, this is a great statistical tool provided the treatment doesn't interfere with the, the washout or the, the, the sort of the treatment doesn't interfere with the control session. Um, the reason this is powerful is you you need far fewer subjects when everybody gets to serve as their own control. So it greatly reduces the you know basically the, the cost and logistics of a study. Uh, but you run into challenges, right? So if you take twenty people are going to take this drug that is supposed to you know help them exercise better for eight weeks and another group is going to take a placebo for eight weeks and exercise and then everybody switches because that's the right way you would do it you had some people start first on the treatment some people start first on the placebo you have to figure out is there do you need a gap between the treatments because will the effects of that drug linger into the placebo period for one group which is not what's happening to the other group and even if it is um if you're only doing it with one group are you confounding the effect of that treatment? I hope that makes sense, Bob. I don't know if I'm making sense. I know you know what I'm saying, yeah. but is there a better way to yeah. explain that? I think that makes sense. The one other point I was going to make about that too with the crossover groups, I was going to ask, ask you about that because I've seen the, the, the statistical power, I guess you would call it, of the crossover groups. As you can see, relatively small studies, not yep. a lot of people, pretty short, and you look at the p-values, and we'll get into that, but they're, you know, 0.000, you know, something. And I, I guess, uh, the, like, the assumption when I was thinking about it, when you're talking about it, and, you know, they serve as their own controls, it's almost as if they're treating them like if you if you could get identical twins and randomize those, those identical twins to one group or the other, you would think that's great because you're controlling for so many things um, about, you know, the physiology or the the the, the genotype, et cetera, about those people. And it's almost like they treat these crossover groups as that you're, 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 you're almost cloning these people. You're comparing them to themselves. But I think you, it's, a, it's a good point. And there might be something about the order of, of the, the treatments that they receive. If they get you know, treatment A and then treatment B, maybe you know, one might have an effect on the other. And the really good ones go A, B, and then B, A. They divide them into two groups and go A, B, and right. B, A. And, and yeah, it, it really comes down to the fact that you can use a, what's called a paired T-test. Um, and, and the, 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 st the simplicity of the statistic of the paired T test is, is part of its elegance here. And that it, it, uh, it, it basically eliminates a lot of variance. Um, okay. So then we talked earlier about this blinding. What does that mean? So in an ideal world, both the subjects and the investigators should not know who is getting the treatment and who is getting the placebo at a minimum the subjects should not know. That would be single blinding. But again, double blinding is always preferred if possible because the um, investigators can be biased. They can have hidden biases um, if they know the outcome. So for example, um, if patients are being given a drug for weight loss, you could say, well, it's pretty easy to you know, blind the patients from that. But if the investigators know that, they might behave differently towards the patients for whom they expect greater weight loss if they believe that this drug is effective. So again, very important and sometimes very challenging. You know, I think we talked about this in the podcast with Rick Doblin. One of the huge challenges of studying psychedelics is it's very difficult to blind 
anybody, mm. but it, it, most of all, the user, right? The subject, you know, when you, one group is getting psilocybin and the other group is getting, even if it's niacin, which causes some flushing, you know, it's, it's, it's not hard to know which group you're in and that may affect the results. Um, size matters, duration matters. Um, and, and, and basically the, uh, the generalizable, generalizability of the study. So is it in a population that replicates or looks like what I'm interested in studying, whether it's me or my patient or whomever I, I care about. And there are strengths and weaknesses to mass heterogeneity of studies. So the more heterogeneous a study in terms of its patient population, well, the more generalizable the results are, but the higher and uh, the higher the bar for finding it. So one of the big, uh, I think this is, I think this has got a lot of attention lately, but I think for a while it was a relatively unknown kind of dirty little secret of medicine was how many clinical trials involved men only and how many drugs were approved for both men and women, but on the basis of only being studied in men. Uh, and the rationale for this was that it was more complicated to study women, right? So women, mm -hmm. especially premenopausal women, because they have a menstrual cycle, that really changes things hormonally. And therefore, it's more complicated to do studies and look at drug kinetics and all sorts of things in women. And so the easier way to do that was to just study it in a, hetero in a homogeneous population of men. Well, of course, that poses an enormous problem if you're now trying to extrapolate the utility of that drug in women. So uh, it's an extreme example, but a very important one. Um, for large studies, you you tend to want to know, is this is this a multi-site or a single site? Again, Predimed's a great example, right? So you had a multi-site study and there were probably significant differences between how the sites were run. So there's an advantage to multi-sites because in theory, it brings more heterogeneity. It should cancel out the effect of any one study over another, but it's harder to control. And therefore you can have, whether it be deliberately or non-deliberately rogue studies uh, or sites rather introducing more, more bias. Um, I think another thing I really look at here is <clears throat> how big is the association of the effect? Um, and we'll talk about this with power, but you can have something that is statistically significant. So, in that sense, the study is quote unquote a success, but it's clinically irrelevant. The effect is not that big. So we, we've tested this new drug for blood pressure and it lowers systolic blood pressure by one millimeter of mercury after a year of use. And it's like, okay, that might be statistically significant if the study was large enough. Is it clinically significant? Almost assuredly not. Um, you want to pay attention to what the adverse events were, um, both in frequency, severity, and distribution. Um, you want to pay very close attention to who funded the trial. Uh, trials don't fund themselves and, uh, a lot of trials are funded by drug companies. Now, again, they're usually done with, um, very clear data monitoring and data analytics. And despite all of the sort of fear mongering out there, it's not like pharma really gets to put their hand on the scale of these pharma studies. Um, but where I think things can get a little dicey is in terms of, you know, things getting buried in supplemental journals and things like that. So, so you do want to pay a bit of attention to who's, who's funding a trial. And, and, and I think e even more important than that is kind of understanding what the conflicts of interest are of the authors. And, and nowadays those have to be declared, but there's been a huge amount of hoopla over that. And there have been some very famous examples of, um, people who are on editorial boards of journals or publishing like crazy and not declaring that, Hey, I'm a paid consultant of these 10 pharma companies and I'm writing, uh, or doing experiments on drugs by these people, or I'm an editor on journals that are commenting on, on, on this. And then finally, you, you really want to understand if the study was adequately powered. And this becomes very important if the study has a null outcome.